politicians say the stupidest things. We'll count down the dumbest quotes of the year from our political class. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning into the program. I hope everyone out there had a wonderful Christmas with their families. I hope you got to celebrate in a way that you wanted to, in a way that perhaps you couldn't last year. Well, this entire week on The Candace Malcolm Show, we're gonna be focused on end of the year stories, countdowns, uh, just looking back at the year that was. We already did our fake news awards. You should go check out that show. It was a lot of fun. We nominated a bunch of narratives as the worst fake news narratives of the year. And then you, the True North viewer and audience, got to vote on what you thought was the biggest fake news narrative of the year. So go check out that episode. It was a lot of fun. Like I said, this week we're focused on the countdown shows, focused on looking at the stories that the media got wrong, the stories that the media ignored, and just the biggest stories of the year. But today I want to focus specifically on our friends in politics because politicians, they, they, they don't always think clearly. They haven't always prepared what they're going to say in advance. You know, you, you kind of assume, especially when you're younger, you kind of assume that grown-ups are in charge and that the people who run the country are serious and well-informed people. And as you get older, or as you start to pay more and more attention to politics, you look around at the people running the country and you say, really? These guys? This is the best we could come up with? And so today's show is, is sort of a lighthearted way at looking inside the minds of, of some of our political leaders to, to realize there's just really not a lot there. There's not a lot going on for some of these politicians. And you might know I have a book out called Stupid Things Trudeau Says. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's a bit of a gag book where I recount the stupidest things our prime minister has said throughout his career. I, I will just note that the book came out, I think it was 2017. So I, I don't, I, it's, not, it's not up to date. I, I have to do an updated version with, with some of his uh, top hits as a prime minister, uh, as a politician, because he said some really, really stupid things during his time as prime minister. And so I, I would usually focus on him, but this year there's just so many other options, so many insane things that politicians said that we thought we would expand the list, focus not just on Justin Trudeau, but on him and all his colleagues and, 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 and count down the stupidest things that politicians said this year. So let's get to that list. So here we have Stephen Gilbo, who accused the conservatives of catering to an alleged extremist element of the party by opposing the liberals' internet regulation bill. Yes, you got it. According to the former heritage minister of this country, Justin Trudeau's minister in charge of what regulating the internet he said that if you oppose internet regulation it is because you're extremist here's that clip i would ask for the date of that quote because the justice department itself has said otherwise we are seeing this government mimic behavior that is consistent with a basic dictatorship it's wrong with their transformational edit that they just made to Bill C-10, the Liberals are trying to give themselves the power to control what Canadians can read online, what they post on social media, and the videos that they watch on YouTube. Again, it's wrong. Why is the government doing this? The Honourable Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, that press release was issued yesterday. Um, I think what we're seeing now is, you know, these are big, powerful, in fact, some of the wealthiest corporations uh, on the planet. And clearly, uh, the, the member opposite and, and, and her party are just afraid to stand up to them. And again, it seems that the Conservative Party is listening to the most extremist element of their party, as they have on very important issues such as climate change or women's rights to choose, Mr. Speaker. And in a similar vein, number nine is Bill Blair, the former public safety minister for Justin Trudeau. So he was talking about a gun ban that the Liberals had introduced. He's talking at the Liberal Party convention in this clip. And he's talking about how the Trudeau government announced that they were banning 1,500 firearms that were previously legal. So there are 1,500 different types of firearms out there that law-abiding Canadians use respectfully, have jumped through all the hoops, follow the rules, follow the laws, do everything they're supposed to, while well, suddenly those people are acting legally by holding these same weapons. And Bill Blair justified this ban, justified this decision by telling the Liberal Convention that people who opposed him were also extremists. This is sort of like a Liberal theme. If you oppose us, it is because you are extreme. Here's that clip. You know, we're seeing ideologically motivated, violent extremists who are using online platforms to propagate and, and advocate for hatred and violence against women, against religious minorities, and anti-Semitic, Islamophobic, um, and hateful speech, and advocating violence. And we can use these red flag laws because I will tell you, many of those extremists, they're not every 
person who's in the gun lobby is an extremist, but everybody in the extremist is in the gun lobby. And I'll give honorable mention to Aaron O'Toole, who had previously been opposed to this gun grab. He had used the uh, pro-gun voters in the Conservative Party to win the leadership that was part of his coalition that enabled him to be the Conservative Party leader. He was a strong proponent of law and order and legal gun owners. And then suddenly in the middle of the election campaign, the Liberals have released an attack ad against Aaron O'Toole saying he was pro-gun. And just like that, Aaron O'Toole flip-flop changed his decision and said that he will maintain the liberal gun ban. Here is that clip. Before I take your questions, I'd like to respond to Justin Trudeau's latest attempt to divide Canadians. So I want to make my position on firearms perfectly clear. First, the ban on assault weapons will remain in place. Second, the present ban on a number of other firearms that were reclassified in 2020 will remain in place. Third, we will conduct a transparent review of the firearms classification process to take the politics out of this process and engage the public in decisions with respect to public safety. Justin Trudeau has been importing American style politics throughout this election campaign, and it is disappointing to see that continue. Okay, moving on, number eight, we have the leader of the NDP party, Jagmeet Singh, who jumped right on the bandwagon when we heard the news that the media just blew completely out of proportion about unmarked graves discovered at residential schools, as you'll know from my reporting and some of the countdowns that we've done uh, at True North, the biggest fake news narratives of the year. Uh, while the media were reporting sort of mass graves and, and evidence of genocide, um, the reality on the ground was, was something more like um, graveyards that had fallen in disrepair. And of course, we, we don't know who, who was buried in these graveyards. It could have been First Nations children. It could have been just old Canadians, early Canadians that were there uh, for other reasons. It, the, there's not really evidence one way or another. Regardless, Jagmeet Singh used the opportunity to uh, echo the worst accusations possible about Canada, and he really, really leaned into this idea that Canada was a genocidal state. So here is Jagmeet Singh telling us what he really thinks about Canada. I'll be calling for an emergency debate today. And in this emergency debate, I want us to take measure of what this means. This mass grave is a painful reminder of the genocide. And what we have to commit to is that in face, in light of this genocide, Canada has to make some real tough decisions about our commitment to remedying this injustice. It's not enough to just reflect on the pain of this injustice. For the federal government, it has to be a responsibility to do something about it. We've got calls for, ac calls for action. The Truth and Reconciliation have laid out very clearly that these are some actions that need to be taken. And so far, only 12 of 94 have been taken. This is a painful moment. And, and while we are all grieving, while we're all reflecting on the pain of this loss, the pain of what this means to think about little kids that are in graves, it can't end at that grieving for the federal government. It has to be a motivation to finally do something concrete. And we've laid out a path of things that can be done right now. And moving on, number seven, this is Alia Hesse, who is a Liberal MP. So, so keep in mind that, that both Liberal and NDP politicians are more than happy to call Canada a genocidal state. They, they repeat it over and over again. Justin Trudeau, interestingly, said that Canada is still committing genocide. In, in 2017, there was a report that was released by his government saying that Canada currently is committing genocide. Not that we did commit genocide in the past, but that we are committing genocide today. Trudeau said that he agreed with that report. So, so, so we have a Liberal government that believes that Canada is currently committing genocide today. And yet when it came to a vote in Parliament as to whether or not China was committing a genocide against the Uyghurs, well, uh, the Liberal cabinet ministers uh, abstained from voting. They didn't want to get involved. And here is a Liberal MP defending China's record. Why did uh, the Prime Minister not show up? And why did all of cabinet not show up for this important vote on genocide in China today? Well, uh, Evan, first of all, I think it's important to uh, point out um, that the government will obviously be very much guided by the debate that took place today. It was a robust debate, and um, I can only speak for myself. Uh, the reason why I abstained is, as someone who has practiced international law, uh, has done international litigation, it was quite obvious to me that um, the facts uh, that have emerged um, are unconscionable, they're egregious, uh, but they do not fit the precise definition 
of genocide. Had the Conservatives decided to say that these were crimes against humanity, absolutely would have voted for them. But in good conscience, right. understanding the definitions, understanding the case law, I could not bring myself to do so. Strange, strange worldview our politicians hold. Moving on, let's look at number six. Calgary's new mayor, Jody Gondek, was elected in 2021. And in her first act in office, the very first interview that she gave after becoming mayor was a show called Real Talk with Ryan Jesperson. Ryan Jesperson is a left-wing activist. And he asked her what her first priority upon becoming mayor of Calgary would be. And she said this. So I asked Mayor-elect Sohi the same thing. Not not like a, uh, you know, sort of a nice phone call or something. I'm talking about something you're going to sink your teeth into, something that is Mayor-elect Gondek's top priority. What's going to be the first thing across your desk? We have had the opportunity to declare uh, climate emergency for years. We have had various um, documents presented to us as a council, and I think we've had more than enough time to review them. So let's get serious, let's declare this, and let's start going after some of the capital that we will see flow in once we make a bold move like that. Okay, moving on, we have Ontario Premier Doug Ford at number five. So in July, Premier Doug Ford told a reporter at a press conference that he isn't concerned about the trend of counterfeit uh, COVID proofs because he did not want to implement a COVID vaccine. I think he makes a pretty good case right here, a pretty good point as to why a society ought not to introduce a COVID passport. Well, as we know, Ontario reversed this decision a few weeks later and we still have a vaccine passport. We still have a split society. But regardless, here is Doug Ford making the case as to why we should not have vaccine passports in our society. Will your government provide an actual card or proof of vaccination? And if not, why not? Well, I, I've never believed in, in proof. Everyone gets their, their proof when they get the vaccination. You're right, anything can be fraudulent, right down from money to uh, certifications. I, I just, no, we aren't doing it. Sim simple as that. Uh, and uh, we're, we're just gonna move forward. Now, if it's federal, uh, getting across the border, that's up to the federal government. Um, we'll, we'll see what they decide to do. I'll be talking to the prime minister tonight, but uh, the answer is no, we aren't gonna do it. We aren't gonna have a split society. Right, moving on, number four, Sylvia Jones, who is Doug Ford's attorney general, made perhaps one of the most insane announcements ever to be made in Canada. So on April 15th, the Ontario government announced an extension of the stay-at-home order on Ontarians and gave themselves more emergency powers. As part of this announcement, the Ontario government gave police the authority to stop people, to stop Ontarians if they were outside of their homes to question them as to where they were going. Yes, implementation of a complete police state. I know we see this kind of stuff in Australia and it is absolutely mind blowing. Well, Ontario tried to do it here. And so here is the Solicitor General of Ontario, Sylvia Jones, saying exactly that. That is why, after consulting with public health experts, we have made the deliberate decision to temporarily enhance police officers' authority for the duration of the stay-at-home order. Moving forward, police will have the authority to require any individual who is not in a place of residence to first provide their purpose for not being at home and provide their home address. Police will also have the authority to stop a vehicle, to inquire about an individual's reason for leaving their residence. Police will stop you in the street. Police will stop you in the street. This is the kind of world that is being created by our political class due to their huge overreaction to COVID. Thankfully, what I think was perhaps the biggest, uh, the biggest good news story of the year is that in response to these insane comments that have no place in a free society, well, several large police departments around Ontario, including Toronto Police and Hamilton Police, publicly said that they would not follow these rules. They publicly said, no, we don't do these kind of things, not in Canada, not gonna happen. A few days later, the government came to their senses and rescinded the order and apologized. Like I said, that's probably the best sign uh, of a good news story that we saw this year. Okay, moving on. I know I say that I usually focus this whole list on Justin Trudeau. Today, he is only going to make two appearances, but they're good ones. They're good ones. So here is number three on our list, Justin Trudeau telling us, telling the world uh, what goes on in that in that head of his and uh, it's specifically telling us the things that he just doesn't think about. You mentioned the Bank of Canada's mandate. Uh, that mandate is actually expiring um, at the end of this year. Uh, if re-elected, it's probably the the review or the extension of the mandate is probably the most the first big economic policy decision you'd make um, after the election. There's some talk of allowing the Bank of Canada to uh, to make some tweaks to the mandate 
to give it a little bit more flexibility to tolerate higher inflation so it could you know help stimulate uh, the economy a little bit more um, in this in, the, in this very difficult time do you have a position on the mandate do you would you support a, a slightly higher tolerance for inflation I don't know. When I think about the biggest, most important economic policy this government, if re-elected, would move forward, you'll forgive me if I don't think about monetary policy. Well, of course, with runaway inflation, with the uh, cost of groceries, gasoline, everything going up, 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 you know, we, what, we, what we really want is a prime minister who does think about money, who does think about inflation, who does think about monetary policies. That's sort of the job of a prime minister. But uh, Justin Trudeau, he, you know, he pays people to think for him. He doesn't, he doesn't think himself. Moving on, number two, this is just such a Justin Trudeauism. He loves to make up words. He loves to say really ridiculous things to prove to us that he is a feminist. He, he, he doesn't act like a feminist, but he, he says he's a feminist. And so I guess that makes him a feminist. Well, during the 2021 federal election in July, Justin Trudeau talked to reporters about the need for conservatives to be more focused on feminist policies like daycare. Well, here is what Justin Trudeau said again to prove his bona fide feminist chops. It is exactly the example of the kinds of things you need to do to counter the she, session, the she session and turn it into a she covering. Fact is, uh, the conservatives don't talk about that in their lengthy platform. It's, it's funny because he didn't even deliver the line properly. I mean, if you're going to make up words like she covery and she session, then then you should at least try to get them right. I know they're hard words to say because they're completely made up and completely nonsensical, but still, you think he would just try to get that delivery a little more smoothly. But alas, it's Justin Trudeau, so we don't have high expectations. And I know you might be surprised because Justin Trudeau came in number three and number two, which means that there's a politician out there who said something even stupider than Justin Trudeau. And this award this year, the top stupid thing a politician says goes to the former minister of the Trudeau government. She was the minister of gender equity. And before that, she was the minister of democratic reform. I'm talking about Miriam Monsef, who lost her seat in this election. I'm not sure it had anything to do with this comment, but but this was one of the most egregious things I've ever heard a politician say in my entire life. So Mary Monsef is giving a plea after, after Afghanistan fell in brutal fashion to the Taliban, Mary Monsef in her role as a government official, in her official capacity, as a government official. Forget about her own background, where she's from, her own ethnicity, her own religious beliefs. She's speaking as an official for the Canadian government, and she refers to the Taliban as our brothers. Our brothers. Let me tell you, Mary Monsef, the Taliban are not our brothers. You are a Canadian. You speak for Canada. And so calling the Taliban our brothers, well, it, it, it is the stupidest thing that a politician said in 2021. So here is what that looks like. I want to take this opportunity to speak to our brothers, the Taliban. We call on you to ensure the safe and secure passage of any individual in Afghanistan out of the country. Well, there you have it, folks, the stupidest things that politicians in our country say. And I have one extra here, honorable mention, goes to, I know, I know the show is focused on Canadians and all, and all of our winners there were Canadian, but I, I have an honorable mention to the U.S. President Joe Biden for completely misleading what will happen after people get vaccinated. So, so, so Joe Biden assured people that, you know, once you get vaccinated, everything will go back to normal. We, we heard that in Canada as well. We heard a lot of politicians say that. Well, Joe Biden went even further and he said this. Now, I want to be clear about what the CDC, CDC is saying and what the CDC is not saying. The CDC is saying they have concluded that fully vaccinated people are at a very, very low risk of getting COVID-19. Therefore, if you've been fully vaccinated, you no longer need to wear a mask. Let me repeat. If you are fully vaccinated, you no longer need to wear a mask. But if you've not been vaccinated, or if you're getting a two-shot vaccine, and you've not gotten your, you only had your first shot, but not your second, or you haven't waited the full two weeks after your second shot, you still need to wear a mask. Look, we've gotten this far. Please protect yourself until you get to the finish line. Because as great as this announcement is today, we don't want to let up. We all know how tough this virus has been. The safest thing for the country 
is for everyone to get vaccinated. And getting vaccinated is easier than ever. So, 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 so there's Joe Biden who wears a mask at almost every single public appearance, and yet he's out there saying that once you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. That, of course, is complete nonsense. I know there are some states where you don't have to wear a mask, but by and large, you still have to mask. You have to mask when you go to an airport. You have to mask pretty much anywhere you go. So, so Joe Biden out there just speaking complete nonsense, which is what he does best. Uh, I guess that's what him and Justin Trudeau have in common. All right, folks, thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show.